Once again, apologies if the audio in this video isn't the greatest. My recording area is still in flux. I'm not the biggest fan of superhero stuff. I've been bored of the MCU since the second Avengers movie. I was never into DC's attempts at the equivalent. I'm ridiculously tired of them being an inescapable, overwhelming elephant in the middle of any media discussion. I didn't even get around to playing Spider-Man until the end of 2021, and I haven't played Guardians of the Galaxy. I only played the beta for Marvel's Avengers because it was a Square Enix game, and the last superhero game I'd played through before Spider-Man was the original Lego Batman in, like, 2009. And up until the last few weeks, I only ever played the demos for Arkham Asylum and City over a decade ago. A few months ago though, I played through Arkham Asylum, Arkham City, Arkham Origins, and Arkham Knight back to back. To be clear, I never thought these looked like bad games, and I enjoyed Spider-Man a lot as well even getting the Platinum Trophy. It's just that generally the sheer thought of delving into these worlds and characters makes me yawn. But I figured, what the heck, why not? I already own Asylum, City, and Night on PC from when they were free on the Epic Store. And in case Night on PC was still a train wreck, I also had it on PS4 through PS Plus. Then I ended up getting a copy of Origins to complete the package, minus a few odds and ends. So there was no reason for me to put them off any longer, outside of the aforementioned general ambivalence towards superhero stuff. Originally, this video was supposed to be a critique of Asylum, from the perspective of someone who had no experience with the game. But then I watched White Light's video on it, and realized that he'd said basically everything I could've and would've, but he'd done so more eloquently. Monty Xander's recent videos on the series are great too, I figured I should note. It's a game with a lot of flaws, but it's also a game that harbors greatness by way of its focus and originality. I really enjoyed playing through Arkham Asylum, and I've since enjoyed playing through all the rest of the games, with Origins surprisingly being my favorite. None of the games are perfect by any means, but they also don't need to be considering how easy they are to slip into today and how well remembered and loved most of them are. Over the course of these playthroughs, the thing that really elevated Arkham's ability to inspire even above games like Spider-Man, and despite Spider-Man being a more polished game for sure, is its unwavering, uncompromised focus on being a Batman game, and particularly in Asylum, a very condensed Batman game. It's not about making me feel like Batman to me, it's about making the things I can do feel like things Batman would do, and tossing away everything else. Allow me to roleplay as Batman with mechanics and a world that are consistent in how they respond to that roleplay. Half of the equation is about not letting me do things Batman wouldn't do, even though that might sound restrictive when said aloud. These games worked for me because I never caught them betraying the characters and the world for the sake of convenience or function or quality of life. As White Light says in his video, there's a reason your default movement is a dominating walk instead of a goofy jog or something you'd find in most other games, because it's more important for the game that gameplay Batman feels as in control of the situation as cutscene Batman acts like he is, rather than simply letting the player get to places faster purely because traditional game design would dictate that's preferable. Again, it's not necessarily about feeling like Batman, it's about keeping Batman Batman, and not letting me make him too un-Batman-like. Batman, Batman, Batman. Has the word Batman lost meaning to you yet? <laughs> it's in the subtleties, like his cape and the rest of his suit slowly getting thrashed throughout the night. It's in the small scale of his environment. It's in the design choice to justify the collectibles as the only way to defeat the Riddler, rather than just having them there for the sake of gameplay. Despite the game's shortcomings, there's a magic to be found in how it all comes together as a unit. Regardless of all the fantastical stuff going on in Arkham Asylum, the world, the focused nature of the gameplay and story events, and the game's understanding of what makes Batman. Batman is what makes it feel so grounded, and the smaller scope does wonders to help with that. Everything is in service to the Batman. With that being said, playing through this game, or 
these games really put into perspective what's so woefully and fundamentally wrong with Gotham Knights and Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League. Yes, the live service RPG mechanics in a game that's not an RPG bloat is tired all by itself. That much is obvious, but I feel like there's a much more frustrating problem that's more specific to games like this. It doesn't matter whether Gotham Knights takes place in the same timeline as the Arkham games or not, and I'm aware that it doesn't. And it doesn't matter that Suicide Squad is about much more than just Batman. They're not solely being compared to Arkham's quality as games, nor the relative purity they have away from the live service grind. They're also being subtextually compared to Arkham's commitment to Batman as an IP and, in Suicide Squad's case, the rules, stakes, and writing precedent that Rocksteady set up in the previous titles. One of the questions being asked when people see Gotham Knights and Suicide Squad is, why do these choices belong here in this game? And I think that's a fair question. Even if many people can't put it into words, the sentiment of that question is what many people are feeling when they see these games. They're asking questions like, but why would Batgirl constantly be swapping out her equipment like this? Or questions like, why is the same Harley Quinn that we know from the Arkham series leaping around like she's suddenly part of Sunset Overdrive? Yes, it's a problem that Gotham Knights is kind of just a generic beat-em-up, and that Suicide Squad just looks like another third-person co-op movement shooter like we've seen over and over and over again for years now. But I believe it's a bigger problem that neither game feels like they fit within Batman's world, let alone the world of the Arkham games, which again, Suicide Squad has to fit itself into. Arkham felt contained. Each game led into the next in meaningful ways, just like many of the comic series often do. It felt like a very specific version of Batman's world that had established its own conventions, rules, and limitations. A world where some things that might normally be part of Batman's stories aren't, whether that be characters, events, rules within the fiction, or whatever else. Kind of like how some Spider-Man adaptations have Peter with web powers, and some with mechanical web shooters. They trimmed what would have bogged down their story goals and world in Arkham, and then stuck to what reinforced it. Heck, from what I found along the way, there was barely even any mention of the rest of DC's stable of heroes and villains across all the Arkham games, beside the odd mention of places like Metropolis simply existing. Superman never shows up to help, the Flash never called Bruce to chat. In a way, it felt like that stuff wasn't compatible with what Rocksteady was doing, and so they made these stories work without them. Yes, the randomized, scaling, rarity-based loot garbage is exactly that. Garbage. I'm not gonna act like it's okay, it's not, it's tired. It's all but guaranteed to dilute the action-oriented mechanics at best, and undermine or outright ruin them at worst. You could have the same weapons and equipment with nothing but passive abilities or something instead, and it would serve the exact same purpose without the bloat of stat growth. But that also wouldn't solve the problem either, because it still wouldn't make sense for someone like Batgirl to swap her suit and weapons out every five minutes. In-universe, it's established that a lot of effort goes into making the tech in these superhero outfits and their weapons and such. They're designed to give a bit of uniqueness to these characters and reflect their actual character. So if you want the swapping of equipment to feel like it fits in, it probably shouldn't be random. Obtaining new equipment should be a necessary story beat, like the few times Batman swaps suits in the Arkham games. Or it should be set up as something the characters work hard to perfect. Even in Marvel's Spider-Man, the writers do something to establish the idea that Peter's always working on a new suit with new advantages, so that swapping to other suits doesn't feel divorced from the world. It means something to the experience that each Arkham game takes place over a single night, and that within that single night he obtains or modifies his equipment within the story, not independent of it. Some of the choices made in these new games could be justified, but they aren't, and it makes them feel cheap. It makes them feel like other games with other goals that a Batman skin was slapped on top of. Arkham never needed to compete with the MCU to have stakes worth investing in. Even by the time the MCU was the massive force it is now, 
the Arkham games kept themselves contained. It didn't have to turn into a supergroup Justice League story about world-ending stakes. The villains were allowed to have goals related to Batman and Gotham, rather than the entire world. And like, I get it if the devs want to tell a grander story in a game like Suicide Squad, but so far, it doesn't feel like it's worked into Arkham at all, even though it's supposed to be. It's bright, it's more comedy and wit than darkness and struggle, and even though the world in Arkham was always bigger than Gotham, this simply doesn't feel like it's part of that same world. I can't imagine all this other stuff existing outside of the absolute hellhole that is the Arkham series Gotham. Why would the Harley we see in these games, or Deadshot we see in these games, be pulled into any of this? Why would they be tasked with saving the world? Harley in Arkham can barely tie her shoes. That's the joke. Outside of one 20 minute DLC for Arkham Knight, with about three encounters where you play as her, she is shown to be largely incompetent, and now we're just expected to accept that despite being imprisoned for years at this point, she can suddenly jump around like a kangaroo blasting and destroying forces involved in a threat so powerful they can corrupt the world's superheroes. Between Suicide Squad and Gotham Knights, the latter is instead the darker game, and yet that's the one that isn't part of the same universe. But it also doesn't build its mechanical identity around the world it takes place in. Bat Cycle? Cool. Why though? In what way does Gotham Knights use it as more than just basic, lifeless transportation? How is it not just a superhero skin on a random motorcycle? Because whether people like or hate the Batmobile in Arkham Knight, they made it feel like the gadget-laden monster truck supercar tank monstrosity it is. It wasn't a car, it was the fucking Batmobile. They made it feel like the vehicle the Batman would have. They made it feel like an indispensable part of his arsenal for that adventure. Not just because he needed a tank, because he also needed the sonar upgrade, and he needed the grapple winch, and he needed safe transport for his allies and his defeated enemies along the way. These were things that felt like they could only be afforded to him by the Batmobile. Doubly so when you consider that, while it came with its own design problems in terms of gameplay, he already had excellently efficient transportation with his glide and grapple hook alone. Batman and Arkham Knight didn't need the Batmobile to get around, just like he didn't need it in previous games. It just happened to also serve that purpose well. The Bat Cycle in Gotham Knights, though? What does it do? The Arkham series, and most strongly Arkham Asylum, were comfortable with Batman being Batman. It was comfortable with him being the tough, rich gadget bro on a little island off the coast of Gotham on a single night where Joker wants to wreak some havoc. Rocksteady and WB Montreal did the work across that quadrilogy to make that feel comfortable for the player to roleplay as. They had the courage to make those choices that would be panned in other games, and then they put in the effort to make it work. Don't take my word for it, of course. There's a great talk from DICE 2012 you can find online, where Sefton Hill, one of the co-founders of Rocksteady and the director of the main three Arkham titles, discusses their approach to make Arkham Asylum and Arkham City, and a focus on cutting what might have been great design, but wasn't great design for a Batman game, was important there. They also emphasized strengthening what was already working, rather than trying to make up for the weakest design aspects. Sometimes this would improve those weak aspects, naturally. Sometimes it allowed them to see how the best part of that weak design could be folded into another mechanic to make it stronger, and other times it was worth just cutting all together. But the important bit is that the design philosophy of the Arkham series originally seemed to very much be about focus, intent, and making a uniquely engaging game that works for Batman, not just a game that's 75% Batman, 25% popular gimmicks. And that's what I felt most in these games as a first time player. I may have some problems with each of them, but I feel what Sefton Hill was talking about when he mentions that the world design of Arkham City is very, very similar to Asylum. It's much more like Asylum, but a bit more sprawling and less rigid than it is your usual open world. They kept their focus and it made all the difference, where Gotham Knights and Suicide Squad seem to have failed to do that to a large degree. 
that's not to place the blame for Gotham Knights and Suicide Squad's decisions on the developers. Yes, I include Gotham Knights and WB Montreal in that. Don't forget that Origins is my favorite. They're more than competent developers. A lot of the rough design and red flags in these games very much might have been publisher suits forcing their hands. Warner Bros is Warner Bros after all, and although Sefton Hill shows some appreciation for their publishing choices during that dice talk, a lot can change in 11 years. Not to mention WB just generally being an awful, vile company these days. Publisher demands can have cascading effects on the rest of the design, even with the best developers. It can be a huge wrench in the design philosophy gears Sefton Hill outlined in 2012. It can greatly limit scope, change focus, and even force systems to be left unfinished. Gotham Knights isn't WB Montreal's problem, it's Warner Bros. problem. And the same will be true of Suicide Squad depending on what is revised after the massive delay. And to be clear, a game that metaphorically shoots Batman in the heart so that it can end up being a competent live service third person movement shooter thing is still better than a terrible mishmash of junk that can't fulfill your Batman universe related fantasies, nor be a competent live service third person movement shooter thing. Maybe these developers for these games had no choice but to put in these loot systems and a lot of these other questionable, generic, ill-fitting design bullet points, and maybe they chose to prioritize making sure those were as good as they could be instead of ruining the entire game by trying to downplay them. Or maybe what we saw from Suicide Squad really didn't represent the game as a whole and was just a really bad look at what it was supposed to be. We'll probably never know. All we do know is that these choices don't fit, and they weren't made to fit. Good or bad raw design, they don't justify their existence within any part of the game as far as people have seen or played. It says something worth taking note of, that Arkham still impresses today, and that I could more than happily go through all four games back to back, without any fatigue. It says something that these games are only as long as they need to be. It says something that the mechanics of the world, story, and the game, that almost every decision within these categories feels completely justified, even if not everyone loves them all. It says something that you can call it the Arkham series. And if you've played these games, a very, very clear picture of what that means resolves in your mind. Even if Gotham Knights was the best game it could have been, and even if Suicide Squad is as well, they won't be valued or remembered in the same way as the Arkham titles, and that has little to do with the polish or fun factor or depth or even the originality of them, I feel. Instead, it has everything to do with the same things that caused people like me to dislike Star Wars Rogue One, and for people to dislike Aliens Colonial Marines, and for people to dislike Sonic Lost World, or why plenty of people don't like Crisis Core, or why people didn't like the Boots in the Air Call of Duty titles, or Metroid Other M, or Resident Evil 6, and it's why I wouldn't have much interest in playing the new Hogwarts and the Crimes of the Bigoted Author game, even if J.K. Rowling didn't suck as a person. Because in one way or another, even though many of these games and experiences are genuinely competently made, they don't commit to what makes those universes grounded within themselves, and what makes those series artistically or mechanically special. They don't properly contribute to feeling like a cohesive whole. It has nothing to do with the name of the series or anything like that, either. Resident Evil 6 is still a Resident Evil game, period. Sonic Lost World is still a Sonic game. Gotham Knights is still a Batman game, and Suicide Squad is still an Arkham game, but even though both Resident Evil 6 and Sonic Lost World definitely have their bright spots and could even pretty easily be argued are good games, they don't trust their own identities to carry them through their design. So they default to safer design that has little to do with what they are. You can't justify Deathstroke or Robin sifting through piles of loot they find laying on the ground after a fight, and using that instead of their purpose-built equipment. You can't justify random thugs running around with the type of equipment they'd use either. You can't justify a random motorcycle as the Batcycle purely by way of putting a Batcycle skin on it. 
This would be less of a problem if Arkham and other Batman media hadn't so clearly outlined the foundational aspects that can't be changed without a more substantial restructuring. If you suddenly want Batman to become a crazy anti-hero, you're not using Bruce Wayne, right? And if you are, it's not going to be Bruce Wayne acting that way of his own volition. Something meaningful will have to have driven him to that, you know? You have to create the rules and then write by the rules you set up with your characters, and if you're using an existing IP, there are going to be rules set up for you. If you don't successfully navigate these barriers, your game design becomes transparent, showing all the underpinnings that don't fit the IP. Your world building becomes weak, and your game loses some of its social value as a shared experience. It turns your work into junk food people eat and forget. You didn't munch on some good Batman pot pie made fresh by Alfred on Christmas Eve, you ate a handful of that smacks. None of the Arkham games were junk food. They were a special request gourmet meal made specifically for people who wanted Batman games. Gotham Knights is clearly rough, and despite despising the live service RPG slapped onto other games stuff Destiny popularized, Suicide Squad could be an amazing game for all we know. But the way they're designed now, they could have never been as special as the Arkham series is and will continue to be purely because they can't commit to being experiences set in those worlds. Even a spin-off or an alternate universe take needs to understand what motivates and grounds its universe, otherwise it'll never become bigger than the sum of its parts and transcend its contemporaries. I think it's time for more games to take note of this and start better integrating their game design choices into the rest of what makes their worlds and stories valuable. Nobody needs another Thor or Green Lantern game that's just a six hour beat em up, and yet that's what these two games are, just higher budget, modern takes on the classic IP slapped on a random game, licensed title. But we don't remember Batman Beyond on the N64, we don't remember Superman for the Atari 2600, we don't remember Iron Man for the 360, Hulk on PS2, or the aforementioned Thor and Green Lantern games. We remember X-Men Origins Wolverine, and Spider-Man 2, and the incredible Hulk on PS2. Maybe it's unfair to hold Gotham Knights and Suicide Squad to the standards of the Arkham series in this regard. But then again, maybe it's unfair to believe that you can just slap Batman paint on a live service pretend RPG and act like people will compromise their standards just to play another game in the Batman universe.